You're listening to The Knowledge Spot, your number one resource for sharing information that promotes success, personal development, and happiness. I'm your host, Jared Cherry, and my goal is to shed a light on the strategies, mindsets, and routines that have led to each of my guests' individual success. Thanks for taking the time out of day to listen, and I hope you enjoy what we have in store. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to The Knowledge Spot today. I've got my guest and former teacher, Brian Katz, on the air with me. And I should, like I just said, Brian was a former teacher with me, and I was fortunate enough to take his klezmer ensemble in university. And, Brian, that was an amazing experience. That was the first ensemble I took where the students felt like they had just as much power as the teacher did in the sense that if we had some suggestions or ideas for the, the music we wanted to play or maybe changes to, to the music that you assigned to us, um, you were open ears. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, man. And um, I would say that I was wondering this right off the bat because that class had a, an interesting mix where you had a lot of music majors like myself, but then you had people who've never been exposed to music in their life, at least from the aspect of playing music. And you kind of had to to work with both these groups and, and meld them together. And I'm wondering, what was that like for you? Um, well, I have a lot of experience having done that for, for many years, and in particular at York University, where a lot of those ensembles are a mix of music majors and non-music majors. And I think it really is very much depends on uh, you know the kind of style of music you're doing. Um, when I was con- conducting a classical guitar ensemble there many years ago, I had people like, you know, grade te- 10 ar ARCT right. level, along with people, non-music majors who were just taking out of interest. That was like a much bigger challenge than the Klezmer Ensemble, um, just because there isn't that much music written for, say, guitar ensemble, where you're going to have a very simple part against a very complex part. Nevertheless, I searched out libraries and readapted parts with Klezmer music because there isn't actually any music except for the main lead sheet where, where the melodies and the chords um, are presented, uh, you're pretty well making up all the parts anyhow. So what I uh, instructed you and your, your classmates to do was to find ways in the style to make up parts. So with because that's so much part of the style, the making up of the parts, then I could assign simpler parts to people who have you know a, a more limited skill set. So with this music, it works quite well. If somebody can't do something, you know, quick and more virtuosic, I'm not obviously going to assign it to them. I'm going to give them a simple background part. And um, while, you know, this really began at York University as a way to include, you know, more people, and uh, I don't think it was a great sociological experiment. I think it was more a uh, an economic <laughs> experiment that is pr- that has proved worthwhile, but uh Perhaps there's more to it than that, and I'd be I'd be glad to know that you know that from the top they are really interested in this idea of mixing people with lots of experience with people with with very little, um, and it and it's 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 driven a number of us a little bit crazy over the years, but uh, I I found that it's really helped me to grow as a teacher to be in situations like that. Well, here we have like a group of people with mixed skills now. How, how are we going to make excellent music? And, uh, and that, that is a real situation that happens at, as a teacher, as a workshop leader. And I think it's a, it's a humbling experience. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to, to feel like you can go anywhere in the world to work with you know, multiple groups of people with varying skill sets and for, for everybody to have a satisfying experience. Because the real trick is not to intimidate you know the, the, you know the beginners or the super advanced people. How are you, how are you going to please everybody? Um, so uh, <laughs> it, it's absolutely challenging. But I, I have to say that over the years, while I resisted it, uh, sometimes I also find it a very exciting proposition to continue um, to work like that in life. Interesting. So um, what you're saying is you actually prefer it this way rather than let's say if it was auditions or music majors only you think it's better that we have this mix well i think it, i think it's really an exciting challenge i think if i was only doing that and not getting opportunities to to work with people um that have uh a more aligned skill sets then you know 
I, I, I'd be more frustrated, but I, I like it as as something in my life that I think is important because there is so much snootiness in the oh, man. In, in the music <laughs> world and the arts world in general. There's there's so much elitism, and that goes right back to you know just your your European I, ideals beginning of the 18th century of what art is, yeah. and uh, that's that's a that's a whole long discussion in there. But but there's a lot of you know, elitism in art, and I think it's, uh, I think it's wonderful to to have these uh, opportunities for, for students and teacher alike that that really pushes those conventional uh, boundaries of training. Right, and I, I couldn't agree more with the the snootiness um, part of music. And to me, that was something I only got to recently discover because um, we've been over this before. But my background with music, I say it all the time, was I played in a garage band when I got into university for music. I I knew zero theory. I knew, um, you know, I had no ear training, none of that stuff. So, I the musicians I hung around with were the opposite of the kind I came into contact with at school and I was really shocked to see how often I was I don't want to say bullied because it, it really didn't affect me in that way but attempted to be bullied on by by um, specifically students who were enrolled in the jazz and classical kind of um, performances mm-hmm. yeah it, it was uh, it was a real eye opener when I told people oh yeah I'm, I'm technically enrolled in world music I'm playing in klezmer and I'm playing in samba and you know they would kind of roll their eyes and go oh that's the easy stuff and I didn't get it because oh. I auditioned to York for jazz I got in as a jazz major I just yeah. chose to take world music so and you know it's challenging in its own right it's completely different and it was a real eye opener to me to see this wow there's there's just different kinds of bullies it doesn't matter what discipline you're in I was in kin before this and um, there you had the classic jock you know what I mean like big football player guy and here I had like you said more more snobs yeah yeah no it, it's uh, there there's a there's a, there's a long and very hard tra- tradition of almost boxing like energy between musicians you know <laughs> you know especially in a climate that, that that's been in, in jazz for so many years uh, of, of you know kind of trying to knock somebody out so, so to say so you can get get the gig i mean when i started reading more about the sociology of jazz i was just like appalled at the kind of things that happened um you know it's well documented now that this whole idea of like you know cutting sessions and if you couldn't improvise on this particular piece uh you know, you just weren't one of the boys, and yeah. and you're, you're not you're not going to be in the club, and and uh, it's you know it's uh, I, I mean even Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker invented a lot of these very complex um, harmonic formulas in part to actually keep people who were not really serious about the music out, and one can say well you know people you know. People of color, and 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 given that they were hardly making any money, and and, and and so forth, and having a pretty horrible lifestyle in many ways, this was this was kind of like a defense mechanism. This is like a way of saying, you know, unless you're really, really, really serious, we're going to like do you know everything we possibly can to right. like make it hard to, for you. That's right, you know. Yeah. It's, um, so yeah, this whole idea of competitiveness and snootiness and elitism—it's uh, yeah. I mean, people are shocked when I talk about that too to 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 people who know less about the you know the history of music that way. You know, really, I thought like you know, music. Everybody's just you know, peace, peace, language, peace, yeah. peace, love, and groovy. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. So then, Brian, what suggestions would you have to a lot of my listeners are probably on the cusp of of trying an instrument, pursuing an instrument or music in general, and hearing something like this might deter a lot of them. Would you say this is something you just, you have to ignore and go forward anyways? Well, absolutely, you have to go forward. And I think we also need to uh, re-envision, you know, the whole notion of like, who is a beginner, who's an intermediate, who's an advanced person? What does that really mean? For example, I've met very, very good producers of music, very good technicians, people with, you know, their ARCT and so forth. So on paper, they have like a lot of training. But if I ask them to um, play, uh, you know, a simple excerpt of classical music or a pop song or even do a little variation on Mary Had a Little Lamb, they're kind of stunned. They've had a very kind of specific training. And then there's other people that have had 
more of what's called, you know, informal music education, you know, more hands on. They learn themselves, maybe right. through maybe through friends, through a lot of listening, which is obviously the most important thing in, in, in listening. Those people like on paper are not musically educated. So what I say to everyone really is that there's no such thing as a beginner really because music education begins in the womb as soon as soon as you're like you know two months two months in in in, in into becoming <laughs> right, right. <laughs> some would argue that you've already became yeah, but, um you are you're already listening you're listening to um your mother's heartbeat respiration all the sounds around you particularly the rhythmic impulses that's the first part of the ear to develop um and uh you know, if you if you if you've been exposed to music um, through the through the mother's singing voice, through you know recordings, live concerts, and stuff, you you have been invited uh, into the world of music education. Nobody is really a beginner. Nobody really comes in here with a blank slate, unless you were actually raised without any sound around you whatsoever, which is actually an impossibility because there's actually those rhythmic gestation sounds that, that, that happen in the womb. Right. So we are all <laughs> musically educated. So you can get, you know, person A who's, uh, who has an informal uh, music education, uh, maybe coming to playing an instrument, say, at the age of, age of 30. And they might say, well, I know nothing about music. I, you know, I, I've never played, da, 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 da. And you start really to spend time with such a person and you realize that they've got all kinds of melodies and all kinds of things floating in their consciousness they just never really explicitly realized it the person who's had who's, who's had a rich love of music and has been around it is going to get way farther faster than a person who, who might have come th- come through a lot of technical discipline but actually maybe didn't hang out with music didn't jam maybe didn't even listen a ton Right. So, so it's like there's a lot of blurry lines between various various levels. Anyhow, I agree. Yeah. Um, and I, I gotta say, just for listeners too, um, in my case, it, it was like Brian was saying. I came in not with a blank slate, but like I said, I my exposure to music was purely hands on. It was purely me learning from myself, from myself, trying to play with some friends, and I have seen that as a huge advantage over these players who have been playing for ten years with um, very technical teachers and mm-hmm. studying in schools. You know, it has its its plus and minuses, no doubt. Yeah, sure. But um, in, in you definitely – what I would want to say to, to listeners who are considering pursuing an instrument is just go for it. It's just, it's just like anything else in life. Like we were saying before, there are going to be bullies, no doubt about it. But um, you, know, you can't let that stop you. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's, uh, you know, maybe you get a T-shirt, you know. <laughs> don't, don't bully <laughs> yeah. prospective music students. Yeah, and just to think of it as a continuum. Like, every, you know, we have our ears open all day, and that's all – that is all ongoing – music education it doesn't just happen you know in the practice room it's a big misconception it really is if you have an open ear open heart good working brain you are you are digesting the sounds around you and you are forming your musical vocabulary and what what that's um reminds me is uh, I, I had a very good teacher who once told me that the um the vast majority of our rhythms at least in a common time signature like four four or two two they they don't come from from earlier forms of music they actually come from the beat of our heart and the way humans walk because that's a very rhythmic thing and absolutely yeah so it's like you said even when we're in the womb you're already being exposed music is just a a natural human experience and we all need to embrace it in my opinion beautiful yeah and uh, th- that actually makes me wonder too then do you think music education is for everyone i think music is for everyone and as i you know just said the education is happening whether we're you know conscious of, of it or not uh in saying what i just said i would like like to invite people to be more conscious of the fact that we are all, all in music education Think of it as a parallel to other kinds of education that we do on a regular day-to-day basis. Verbal education, literacy education via reading, uh, our sensitivity to color, 
via looking at be it advertising or going to a gallery we are we are engaged we are learning if we are alive and open right and when you speak about these other things that we're naturally learning like reading or improving our vision those all have very specific benefits i you might read a little better you might read a little quicker um with music you could say the same thing you might play music a little better but do you think that music has other qualities and, and when i say music i mean the pursuit of music that transcend just music alone there used to be in the academic world a lot of um attention given to what are called, you know, extra music, ex, the extra musical kind of qualities. And that's kind of come back as a platform to raise an awareness around the importance of music education um, in the schools. And I think it's important that we look at some of these, these extra benefits. For example, our cognitive abilities um, become quicker. That that's been that's been shown through through research. Do we look at these benefits as ways of helping the, helping the human being to grow in all in all kinds of ways? But I think the emphasis needs to be on music. So if you if you if one is saying that music helps you in math, to realize that your brain is getting quicker through the kinds of listening experiences and perhaps playing experiences that you do and that might have a result uh, a benefit to other other ways of learning but to use music specifically for that i think is actually really going against the whole notion of that we need art in our our lives as as an expressive tool as something that helps us widen our horizons over the so-called you know, uh, you know, every every dayness of life. I think music is really needs to be considered as it is in a lot of more ancient, dare I say, primitive civilizations as part of just part of the fabric of life. Right. And what when you um, talk about that, um, kind of like the wrong the wrong uh, motivation to pursuing music, i.e. This, this motivation that derives from the understanding that music will help you in other aspects of your life and that being the only the only motivation you have. I, it, it reminds me of um, when I started teaching, I noticed right away that um, a lot of my students coming from certain cultures who – very clearly understood that enrolling their child in, in music would improve their abilities in math and improve their abilities in learning in all kinds of ways. They understood that the problem was that when the child got to the age where he or she now had to decide what they're going to do for the next stage in their life, the parents were very quick to disregard music because to them music was simply a tool to help them pursue other things. It was never meant to be the main pursuit. And I felt like that was always a waste. I saw I saw a lot of people who had great potential essentially throw it away, even though deep down they didn't want to. Oh, boy. Yeah, no, I've heard that story over and over again. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's highly prob problematic. And I think we get a lot of uh, music education trauma really, at, you know, resultant from that. People that are, you know, engaged in are not engaged or having to go to music lessons for for the wrong reasons um yeah you know you articulated that really well and it's 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 a really sad story and i see even as i alluded to just a few minutes ago um with the coalition for music education which is like an organization that is really out to i mean bless their heart you know to sit to save music and, and i just uh, f filled out a questionnaire for them recently and i see that their emphasis is still very much coming from that kind of place not exclusively i have to say um but there there still is like you know, they're really barking up the wrong tree you know music's going to make you smarter to, it will I agree. Okay, but this is not the reason to do right. music. You You're know, the point, uh, exactly. Yeah, you know, like there's just so many other benefits to, um, you know, what does it? You know, it does wonderful things for your brain. It's a beautiful cognitive experience. Playing a piece of music or listening to a piece piece, piece of music is a beautiful cognitive challenge. You know, uh, so keep it there, and it's oh, it's a beautiful musical cognitive challenge. It, you know, the fact that it that it that makes synapses fire off tremendously is going to feed into your math. Great, but don't that should not be the primary selling point. 
And I know as we're talking about this, or once this episode goes live, rather, I'm going to get a bunch of angry emails from parents going, I don't want my kid to pursue music because he'll not make any money. And Brian, you're someone who's not only pursued music, but you've stabilized yourself with music. Like you, you live a stable life. And if, if this is too personal, we don't have to talk about it. But what would you have to t- say to, to these parents, someone with inside knowledge like yourself, how would you tell these parents – it's not that bad, or is it that bad? Well, no, it's it's not that bad, and I, I think we should just not be dealing with you know even the good bad, you know dichotomy. Uh, I think uh, being a musician uh, has been dichotomized so much, or being an artist in general, we tend to think of people because of this incredible bastardization of the commodification of art like we've never seen it before and particularly in music we tend to think of people who either made it like super super big you know or people that are struggling like you're you know you're you're you know dare i say your average person out there when you when you tell them you're a musician it, it's like you know they they, they kind of say well what, so what do you do to make a living <laughs> I, oh yeah I, I've had that experience even playing, you know, um, twice I was actually at a private party. I was playing <laughs> piano and stuff. And, you know, somebody came up to me like during the gig. So you play really well. What do you do? Oh, my <laughs> I love that, you know. Uh, so I think, you know, the thing is, like, there's many, many ways to make a living in music. You know, some people, you know, ended up, you know, r- writing film or, t- or television music or or teaching or becoming DJs or there's just like such a wide variety and many and many uh, musicians who are good entrepreneurs and are interested in a lot of things which is which I think holds true for many of us make their living you know with a, with a variety of things through 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 doing some teaching doing some performing I think people just like need to not be scared about it and most importantly I think we all need to be encouraged to to follow our heart and follow our, our life dreams and to understand the fact that when you're when you're training to be an artist, um, you know, professionally, that it's a long it's a long apprenticeship. So you might you might need to find a whole bunch of you know, possibly other part-time jobs along the way or hopefully some things, you know, in your field, but it's not gonna be like you're you know, going to graduate with a law degree and and get hooked up with a firm in one or two years. Exactly. It's just it's going to be a longer road, and people need to be um, supported with that, and they need to be aware of that, and that it's not just about like you know the very few people make it, and there's you know there's all kinds of people in the music business that you don't know their names, um, but they're making a living um, as being a musician. I, I did a program. Uh, that was actually funded by the Toronto Musicians Association some years ago. I thought it was an excellent program. Um, Alan Hetherington was involved and Jane Fair. We went around to schools to actually talk to kids, actually ele- elementary schools and uh, junior junior high schools, to talk to kids about what it is to be a musician. And the thrust of the program was music has become more than ever a commodity, a product. When people think of music, they don't necessarily think of musicians. If they do, they think of only famous musicians. Right. It's not like back in the you know 17th century and people were working for the courts and there was all kinds of different jobs and there was meister singers and troubadours. There was like a zillion different things. But now it's such a commodity. So people think of, of pieces of music. They think of music that they love and they think of very famous people. And they don't think of that whole world in between. So we were there as musicians who are not like very famous in their <laughs> in their in, in their in their world and right. like and we do music we make we talk to the kids about that and we played of course we made it a really you know fun experience and i think that's like so important that people understand because of the industry the hype in the industry we've made music into a product not something that people do Yes, I, I see what you're saying. And I think the other thing I would add to that is um, a newsflash to a lot of these parents who are basically um, deciding their children's life for them is that if if you're going to let your child pursue anything in life, 
the reality is it's going to be hard. It doesn't matter if it's music, if it's business, if it's law, if it's medicine. All of those things I just named, they're going to be hard no matter what. And they're going to be especially hard if that's what your child wants to actually do. Um, so we just got to get over the fact that um, it's not going to be instant money because no matter what you do, it's not going to be instant money. Yes, and and we, we and we all know that that there's uh, there, there's many many factors in, in having a you know a gratifying life, and uh, it's it's proven itself over and over again. You know, people that that you know that, that might might have the fortunes or might have worked their butt off to to garner you know uh, you know a lot of money that is not going to. Uh, guarantee life satisfaction. There's there's something so big that can never be uh, you know underestimated around follow, you know following one's heart. And maybe we need to replace, if you don't mind me saying, Jordan, we need to replace the word hard or even difficult. I was once told in my own teacher training, don't use the word difficult. You know, um, maybe replace it with challenging because challenging has a lot of positive connotations and we all need to be challenged are we are hardwired to be challenged being challenged is very very exciting yeah and that brings up a, a common pattern i've observed amongst all the guests i've interviewed so far is every single one of them and these are all people that i would consider successful that's one of the criteria for being invited onto this podcast is that i've got to first of all i've got to want to talk to you and i've got to think you're successful at least by my definition and every single one of them has gone through either some bout of depression or severe challenge and it, it, they've all risen above that challenge and have actually come to see those challenges and depressions as a positive thing in their life mhm mm yeah well i think uh, yeah if you, you know it, it's it, it empowers all of us as human beings to 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 move through to move through things to you know to gain ex experience and perspective it's uh that's what really helps us to go on and if you can stay with something and that your heart really wants and you can and you could experience what it's like to overcome that the kind of strength that that generates is like tremendous yeah. um, and and e even when you're doing music and, and there's a lot of satisfaction along the way um, there's you know a, a, a lot of our time is is not going to be in these high elated experiences that's also a misconception I think out there that you know musicians are just you know having uh, fun and, and another overused word perhaps you know right. enjoyment maybe in deep enjoyment is, is, is a richer way of saying it um, you know, there's a lot of uh, you know we, we, we get up and, and and do our work, be it uh, uh, you know, be it practicing or, or or contacting people and 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 when you're engaged in composing or or, or improvising or like I said, practicing a work that that's like you're not going to be like high all the time, and, and even in terms of performances, you're not going to be high all the time. The the artist who is you know, who, who, who insists on being high all the time, often and sadly, uh, you know, might, might turn into an addict or, or, or God knows what. But it's very, it's very destructive thinking to go for that elated experience. And what unfortunately does happen with, with, with some artists because because we get that taste of, of that of what we were looking for, that high of like, well, it's all come together to me. I just did like this fantastic solo and I felt good in my body and it, it just, right. it felt, you know, um, that we, we want to have that again. And I think artistic maturity is like learning to say, you know, it's not, it's just not going to happen all the time at that kind of level. You're, you're, you know, you can have a lot of enjoyment without, necessarily that that's super high all, all the t all the, all the time um so we we have um you know it's 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 inevitable that there's just going to be um a lot of um just just plain plain work and and not not uh elated feelings all the time and, and, and that i think that's important that we educate people who are who are on that career path of being an artist that, that that they understand that also so they're not so disappointed right and i think you're touching on a very interesting cultural phenomenon at least in our area in toronto where i can't tell you how many gigs or band offers i've turned down because 
I know that the amount of work going in is not worth the, the reward necessarily. And at the same time, I can't tell you how many times the response I've heard is, Oh well, you're just playing music, isn't it? Just for fun, as in, anyways. You're, <laughs> you know, you know, and it's it's um it's really this disconnect between non musicians and um, professional musicians that they 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 seem to understand as music as being a uh, I, I think you're right when fun is the wrong word here, but just a always enjoyable experience. And the mm-hmm. reality is, just like you said, is that I wake up every morning and I practice for 30 minutes to an hour every day, and that's work to me. That's uh, it's hard work, no doubt. It's it's a lot of work for me to bring my drum kit from my my house in the suburbs all the way downtown, and that you know you've got to make it worth my while. And what we're seeing in Toronto right now is, at least in my experiences, first of all, I'm getting offered the gigs I'm getting offered are, are worth a lot less money. And uh, secondly, is people don't understand why I'm turning these down. It's like mm-hmm. I, I should take it no matter what because I love music. Right. <laughs> uh, well, it sounds like you're 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 exercising a lot of wisdom, and and you're into a beautiful practice. I mean, I highly respect uh, you know any anyone who can um, come into you know a regular practice. It's it's really um, it's very you know it's it's very it's it's very challenging. And uh, and just just getting back to this whole world of um, music education in the broadest sense that that I was that I was speaking to um, for people who do take on instruments or, or singers, obviously who practice voice. Um, I think sometimes you know at music school you're you're you begin to get molded into you need to practice three four hours a day and. What while that well that's true. There, there there's periods in one's life where one really needs to like get into a regular thing and, and do a lot of work. What is not talked about enough is like how does a person get there? Somebody who's beginning university at nineteen, um, mm. you know, uh, in certain schools they might have already arrived at that point because to get in the door you would have had to have done that kind of work. But um, some schools it won't be the case. Um, and you don't, you know, you don't need that like to study, you know, English literature at university. They're not saying, you know, that you've read every work by Shakespeare and, and analyzed it and da da da. You know, it's like you don't have like, you don't have an entrance exam to to, to show that you have been, so to say, practicing literature. Right, right. <laughs> you know, but with music, it's like with music schools, there's like this expectation, and it's really. Um, it really can be the school of hard knocks, and what's not not being said is are are, are spoken about enough. You know, is just um, well, you know, what, what is required to get a person there? Like, let me turn it around and ask you, what you know, what got you to a place in your life where where you could do this every day and schlep your drums and practice every day? Because that's like a really big thing. That's not just about having the time open on the clock you know i realized that myself some years ago like you know you could have open hours does that mean you're going to like actually practice like Mm. you know it it, it's like so there's a lot of things that are going to get a person to that place but sometimes you go to music school they just say you know teacher goes just practice three four hours a day that's what you need to do buddy and so, so i want to turn it around if you don't mind ask you what you know what got you to a place where you could do that regularly? Because that's a big, in my world, that's a big achievement. Right, and um, so first, I think I should make it clear that when I say I practice every day, I don't mean I practice every day. I mean I practice, let's say, five days of the okay. week. You know, that's I mean I'll, I definitely regular. believe yeah. in breaks and balance, and I would say. Great. Um, in my experience, that kind of balance is what brought me to that place. When I realized that when I was practicing, let's say one to two hours every single day, seven days a week, I was really hating, hating what I was doing a lot of the time. And the learning process, it doesn't work in in my experience that way. You can't really learn something effectively while you hate while you hate doing it. So, the balance mm-hmm. for me was a was a huge part of it. And also just knowing that um, once I balance it out. It was it was actually what I wanted to do when I woke up in the morning. It was okay. I just came from the gym. What do I feel like doing? I feel like practicing the drums, and that's what made it so easy. Was just genuinely wanting to do it. Beautiful, it's fantastic. 
Yeah, and now let me flip the question to you because um, for those who don't know Brian Katz, first of all, you got to check him out. But secondly, um, not only is he an amazing teacher, but his um, virtuosity. Is that the right word I'm looking here for? Um, for <laughs> is that the right one? For um, a skilled technical player, Brian is as well and extremely skilled at that. And um, this is, to me, this is so big because we're in an era right now where – you can learn ukulele in elementary school and, and they'll teach you, you know, like five chords. And then a lot of these kids will start their own bands based off these five chords. And it seems to me like the level of actual um, technical musicianship is declining. So I'm wondering, Brian, what <laughs> brought you to your level? Uh, well, there was definitely a number of years uh, just in terms of the process you just described. I, I certainly have a parallel situation um, when uh, – well, I, I, I mean, I love music. I love, I love to sing. I love to move and, and, and sing. When I was a kid, kid a lot, and uh, and I did, uh, you know, go to a conservatory starting at um, at the age of ten, and you know, I started to do some formal practicing. I was certainly engaged in a lot of informal practicing in, in my in my childhood as well. That is to say, playing, improvising, discovering. I didn't know I was really practicing, but I would say that's all part part of the practice. Uh, but there was a certain point, especially as I got more more uh, interested in, in, in both classical and jazz music, um, that I knew that there was a lot of vocabulary that I needed to understand uh, theoretically and experientially. And I definitely, I would say that I forced myself via a love of music, as in your case, that was definitely the driving, the driving thing. I was just absolutely inspired by quite some music. And, uh, and I just, I just knew. Um, I guess I had a few teachers that that that, that were 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 uh, you know rec- recognizing some talent in me, and 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 they were they were guiding me and saying you know you need to do this. And then when I was a jazz student at Humber College, I went there when I was nineteen. Um, there were, there was a program of just like having to do a lot a lot of stuff, and I had a ton of energy, and I really you know I really went for it. I have to say that I really forced myself, and and it had its repercussions. I started getting really, really horrible um, back aches. Um, I was um, just staying up really, really late, and then going to early morning classes. And uh, I practiced in a lot of pain for a number of years. So I have that experience of going against the grain of my whole self. Um, I know it did some good for me as well. If I had to do that chapter again, I definitely would have, <laughs> I definitely would have paced it out more. I wish I would have had somebody saying to me, uh, you know, you're going to wreck your body if you, you know, keep on doing it like that. Uh, Cause I would just spend hours and hours, you know, um, in my room um, alone doing, doing this trip. This is my music world. Uh, you know, having said that, I think at certain points in one's life, when you're gaining a lot of vocabulary and, you're, and you you get very serious about, you know, expanding your skills, you're going to have to do it. But I don't think you have to do it that way. I've learned from my mistakes, and I certainly don't encourage that kind of practicing in my students. You know, I've had a number of students just last year at York, for example, said to me, you know. I know this guy practices six hours a day, and like I just, you know, I just say, do, do, do you realize what it means to practice six hours a day? Like it's this is a heavy, this is a heavy spiritual trip, heavy physical trip, and there's very few people that I know that can actually do that, can concentrate, you know, because it has to do with the quality of practicing as well. And when I was going through my four or five hours a day, I know that I wasn't concentrating at at maximum nothing near it because i was in pain you know so you know i was distracted with pain and probably distracted with all kinds of other things but again going back to what is often quote unquote encouraged you know in 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 music schools like you know this is what you have to do so i think we need to find some other ways of of mirroring what really happens in an artist's career, which is a lengthy apprenticeship model and not trying to squeeze into like say four years of undergraduate that you're going to become out like, you know, a very good musician at the end of it. Cause they're almost treating people like in a very cold kind of way in this sense. If, if you have teachers that are saying, you know, 
practice you need to practice four or five hours a day then you have somebody doing it they're probably going to be in some kind of pain or they're just spiritually whatever just not ready for that that's like going out you know going to like a, you know an ashram in in india and, and and meeting some you know really famous guru and that guru saying uh well yeah we're going to start with five hours of meditation like you know it's like we, we, we need to become much more holistic with the practicing thing. So, yes, I, I logged the hours. I don't know if I logged the, the requisite 10,000 hours. I guess I have at this point. <laughs> um, you know, but I've learned a lot of hard things along the way. And one of the things that has helped me and my students these last years, I've tried to uh, invite them to expand their horizons on Pointing back to what I was saying before, what is music education? Every moment of your life, being an aware person. Uh, don't beat up on yourself when you miss days. If you do a half hour one day and it feels great, great. And, may, and maybe the next day is going to be an hour and a half. Maybe there's going to be two days where there isn't. Um, clearing your head, taking vacations. I mean, keeping body, mind, soul in, you know, in harmony. I'm really not of the school of, of hard knocks. Uh, it will get you certain rewards, but it will right. often it'll often cost you other things. And we see this in the in the case of um, uh, you know young people who are uh, you know young prodigies. I mean, people that lose parts of their lives. Uh, not always, you know. I'm not saying everybody comes out of mess, but a lot of people do come out of certain kinds of mu- music training. Um, uh, you know, a mess. I mean, it really does happen a lot. There's a lot of music education trauma um, out there, and and this is really uh, what what it what it gets is it gets few people in this star status, and it gets a whole world believing in people that are successful in music are stars, and it diminishes this whole other worldview of all of us being really more than allowed into the world of music, music education, music performance, you know, whether it's via being in a amateur choir, whether it's like just sitting down and listening to a recording and enjoying the beautiful, you know, cognitive and, and, and beautiful spiritual, uh, awakenings that might happen through that it diminishes all of that it puts it all like in this little box of like you know if you if you kill yourself you'll become a star and and be able to be successful in music um you know it's a particular kind of success that's often thwarted with all kinds of problems in the meantime people and there's millions of them that make that make a living in music in a you know, more balanced kind of way, just get unnoticed. Unnoticed to the point that there's a whole society out there that is absolutely afraid to even investigate um, making a living in the arts. Right. And just real quick, if I could cut back to the the idea of um, uh, how do I want to word this? The idea of putting in your hours every day as a grind um, may be detrimental. I just want to state that um, while I do agree, I think that that kind of grind does have its time and place. And I can only yeah. speak on my own experience. And that would be when when I was practicing seven days a week for an hour to two hours every day, that was when I was preparing for an audition where I knew I was coming in at a disadvantage. And that was for music school when I knew I had no ear training, no theory training. So my playing better blow them away. So that kind of grind, it, it definitely does have its place. And then it's got its time where you got to you got to get over it and realize that 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 the quality of that kind of um, practice does it's detrimental in the long run. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, I think it's you know it's a different path for for different people. Obviously, um, there there are probably some people who can 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 handle it, and they're just that that's their path to sit in a room for five hours a day and and, and do it. And and um, you know, I mean, bless them. It's just it's just not everybody's path, and and I think we just need to diversify as our our idea of what you know who is who is a who is a great musician you know there's particular kinds of um greatness that looks like you say virtuosity but there's other kinds of greatness where people are making music their livelihood uh they're not necessarily super famous etc etc and uh yeah yeah um so then what's what's going to be happening now is people listening they're going to go okay i I really want to learn an instrument and 
you, Brian, from what I understand, you're well known for embracing a type of music education that uh, – forgive me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but it's eurythmic. Am I saying that right? Eurythmics, yes. Galkros eurythmics. Mm-hmm. So could you explain to listeners what that is exactly? Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, – eurythmics uh, was developed by a, uh, a Swiss music educator and composer named Emile Jacques Delcros, he lived to 1950, and uh, he was really the first person to formally introduce the idea of that the genesis of music really comes from the medium of of the body, and rhythmic rhythm, as you well know, as a drummer, being really. You know the heart. The heart of music is rhythm, right? And rhythm really comes, as you alluded to earlier in the conversation, really comes from the movements of the body. He he divide, devised an approach to music education that used the body at the center. So, for example, you're conducting beats or you're you're walking beats and you're singing while you're walking beats. And he made up all kinds of musical games and exercises to promote a unity of 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 listening to melody listening to harmony feeling the rhythm as the underpinnings of it it's highly highly experiential quite well known in europe and in the states uh, less so in canada there's really probably maybe less than a few dozen probably um, certified Delcros practitioners in this country. Uh, it's something you really need to experience. Uh, for people who might want to read more uh, about it, uh, it involves a lot of improvising as well, so it's a really cool part that obviously attracted to me. Uh, if they go to my website, briancats.com, there's actually three links to um, Delcros organizations. There's some articles and some videos up there, and, and that that would be a good way to um, to look at that. But it's really looking at the – it's a very holistic approach to music education with, with rhythm and, and, and the body – being at the center of it and i think that's so important Uh, again as a drummer um i've come across people who the second they see an odd time signature and maybe not even odd let's say just even three four time or yeah we can go odd like 11 8 or something like that and they start freaking out because they're going oh this, this this isn't natural all of a sudden i say well do you know how people dance this kind of music (laughs) <laughs> exactly. It, it, so for 3-4, for example, if you tell someone, you know, think of a waltz and they're going to go, what the hell's a waltz? Well, open up your YouTube and look up a waltz and watch how they dance. Um, one of my one of my favorite drum teachers told me, a good drummer is a good dancer. And mm. that, that movement that you need to feel those movements to truly um, perform music in the best way. And I'm sure you'd agree. Yeah. And that's really the cornerstone of Dalcross Eurythmics is like um, you have to externalize the rhythm. That, that's to say, you know, allow your students to tap their feet. <laughs> I'm not right. saying do it, do it on the on the recital stage, but there are music teachers, many music teachers, for for hundreds of years, they say don't tap your feet when you're practicing. Um, you know, it's not it's it really could be a very good thing because it could help one to feel the regularity of the pulse, you know, and then right. you get it inside. So uh, absolutely, and, and and going back to your example of like. Uh, you know, uh, playing in uh, what are called, you know, odd meters, 11, 7, and so forth. Uh, you know, I take my uh, music ed students, I teach uh, some music ed courses at the Faculty of Music University of Toronto. And I teach a Del Croce Eurythmics course, and every fall I take them out and we, we actually run. We run in 11. So it's like, you know, we, we, we break it up or we run in 7, for example. So we have wow. like. One two three, one two three four, one two three, one two three four. Right. I, I just have them run, and then we start clapping on the one, you know every every one that first designates the group of three, then the group of four. So you have one two three, one two three four. So imagine this: you're like running, you're doing this, right? And then you start going one two three, one two three four, one two three, one two three four, one two three, one two three four. And I've done that with kids, and you get seven in their body right away. Now, if you try to explain, you know, seven to like, you know, a bunch of elementary kids, I mean, the whole concept of feeling seven, they they they'll understand that four plus three or three plus four or seven. But if you try to get that as a musical experience by putting it on the board which is often the case with music teachers in general. Right. When did most of us learn about quarter notes and half notes? We learned about it as this kind of abstract construct with teachers putting quarter notes and half notes. We didn't learn about like, now walk, here's a quarter note. 
Now walk and leave a space. Ah, there's a half note. So we should really start from that idea, <laughs> not from you know the more intellectual idea, but from the experiential idea. I agree, and I think this actually speaks to a larger phenomenon we're, we're witnessing right now is that, at least again where we're from in Canada, it seems like – there's this um, dichotomy between the brain and the body. When when Westerners think of the brain, they think of this big, pink, gooey thing up in their head, and that's that. But what I've learned in kin is that the brain, quite honestly, it extends from the top of your head where we all think it is, and really it has these wires that will run down all the way to the bottom of your feet. So, Beautiful. I love that. Yeah. So once you start feeling these things with the rest of your body, the, the brain part of you will also see a benefit from that. And music is one of the most apparent ways to see that kind of benefit. Absolutely. That, that's, be- that's a beautiful image. It reminds me of um, – there's a, a doctor, Alfred Tomitis, who, uh, who, who, who wrote a lot of uh, stuff on prenatal listening, uh, a French doctor. And he calls uh, – one kind of listening, he calls it the ear of the body. And to me, that parallels what, what Jacques Dalcros is talking about. It's like you listen – you know, you don't just listen through the ear. You listen through everything. You feel through everything, every sensation that you're feeling, you're like listening. It's not just the ear. The ear is like, you know, the the channel that, that opens up the, open up, well, I wouldn't even say that. The, the experience is just really through everything. The ear is one place where, where, where you listen through. And that's why deaf people also listen. Exactly. They, they, yeah. they, they could hear, but they hear uh, what's called vestibularly on that, on that very, very primary rhythmic shape level. But they, they, they still listen. So you're listening with everything. And I love that image that you just said. The brain just goes everywhere. And I always find it's, fun, it's, it, it's, it's funny when people dichotomize, like, you know, brain and body. You know, the first thing I just, I just want to say is like, well, where does the brain live? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> is, it not, is it not in my body? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really weird to me. And I mean, I'm guilty of thinking that way myself because mm-hmm. that's how I was taught in school to think of my brain. I was taught if I'm sitting at home studying, I'm, I'm working on my brain right now. And if I'm playing sports or, you know, going to the gym, lifting weights, I'm working on my body. And right. I, yeah. what I've been fortunate enough to discover is that when I'm at the gym, I'm getting smarter brain-wise as well. When I'm at yeah, home studying, yeah. it, it all it all adds up together. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's this this kind of um, active, you know, active thinking, which sometimes called procedural knowledge. I mean, it's just starting to really take off. You know, the the uh, I mean, Howard Gardner was one of the first guys to really bring in this whole idea to articulate, you know, multiple intelligences, the intelligence that that happens when when a dancer, you know, is moving. It's a different kind of thinking, but it really is thinking. I you know, I, I try to convince a dancer friend of mine some years ago we were having this conversation. She says, you know, I just don't think when I'm dancing. I said, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, you might not be thinking about, you know, in that kind of very classic way that we think of thinking. I'm right. thinking about something, you know, but in music and in the arts, you know, it's not like thinking, it's a thinking through. It's an education through. Dalcro's Eurythmics, for example, it's an education through music, through the body. It's like, the, it's, it's not thinking about, but you're thinking. We stop thinking. What happens, Jordan, when we stop thinking? Uh, I don't think you can. I don't, you're you dead, don't, right? You're dead. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no such thing. So if the musician tells you, like, you know, I'm just playing, I'm not thinking, they're lying. The dancer tell you know so we're, it, it's like we've dichotomized that so much. It's just like you know it's it's crazy it's crazy making. But we are absolutely we are in a time where educators are absolutely becoming um, more more holistic, um, and uh, it, it's often uh, you know a good uh, you know twenty five thirty years before research that was done really starts to get played out. Like Howard Gardner's book, uh, I think it was nineteen eighty four, Frames of Mind: Theory of Multiple Intelligence, where he talks about you know artistic intelligence, music intelligence. Uh, the movie Close Encounters of a Third Kind by Spielberg came out around that. Um, I think there was a real direct connection to Gardner's work. I've heard about um, and. And it's, you know, and it's, it's, it's really interesting. In 2015, I could really say these last years, I'm seeing more and more of that as I've gone around to schools where 
where that kind that kind of thinking that's not just the sitting down at the desk and thinking about and analyzing a subject but the thinking through the the particular um kind of uh work you're doing it be it be it dancing or theater is is being honored more as intelligence at the same time i just read a big article in the globe and mail yesterday just how drama programs are shrinking we know music programs are shrinking yeah. so on the one hand like teachers are like hip to this fact but on an administrative level when it, when it comes to like you know push comes to shove arts programs are still get still get like cut the fastest yeah for their apparent useful um, um, non-usefulness. <laughs> what a mistake that is. I, yeah. I, I was uh, lucky enough to get tickets to watch. Um, I believe these kids were in the 10th grade and it was uh, a jazz band and these kids went to an art school with a very advanced music program. Uh, the, the name escapes me of the school, but yeah. watching them was just an honor. It was amazing how good these kids were and unfortunately the concert ended with the conductor saying um, starting next year, this program's going to be cut in half and, you know, it's it's going to run half as long and the students aren't going to have as much time with us. And it's like, what a shame. It's amazing what talent that kind of program was breeding. Oh, yeah. No, it's really it's really very, very sad. You know, it's just uh, this whole, yeah, this whole thing about utilitarianism, you know, that we have to train our, you know, our, 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 our kids to do things that are, you know, worthwhile in that practical sense. And, um, you know, Joy, happiness, spiritual fulfillment uh, just don't seem to, you know, that happens so much through the arts, obviously, just don't seem to really, really, still in this day and age, you know, with with so much research and so forth, it still doesn't seem to cut it. Nevertheless, <laughs> it, do, it does seem on a certain level, at least in terms of understanding, I think things are moving in a more holistic direction. So hopefully it'll eventually really infiltrate into curricula yeah i agree i think um i think it's needed and i came from an elementary school with pretty much a non-existent music program um and that was that was my loss in the long run yeah and it's really it's just so uneven it's it's sad and, and I, i've gone around to a lot of schools doing various projects and i see it's just uneven you know some schools like you know have a regular teacher really it depends a lot on the principal um yet when it comes to the other things when it comes to like mathematics like there's just like you know it's cro you know it's it's a must across the board and i'm not right. saying that it that it shouldn't be we need that but i i absolutely feel like music should be and uh yeah so and that uh and that of course really uh really reflects a lot of these societal attitudes around people becoming you know a musician if it's not or just being you know a more musically developed human being if it's not considered you know something important in elementary school uh, then you know our, our our kids are walking around with those kinds of feelings right, right and, yeah. it's, and it's a and it's a real uh it's a real strange thing um in ontario and and in, I, th I think in all the other provinces is that um it's not required to have a music teacher like a professional music teacher a professionally trained music teacher at at the elementary <sighs> level but once you get into junior high and i think that that is so backwards that is where you need <laughs> people with the expertise the most i couldn't agree more I, I can't tell you how frustrated i am when i find out what my students are learning in elementary school or you know it's just it's it's a waste it's you know music is a universal language for a reason it's because all humans can speak through it or under or listen mm. through it and mm. you're, you're just throwing a valuable part of the human experience away when you let people with really no qualifications to teach music teach it yeah, I mean, it's and, and they're and they're so upset, you know. They're really, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm constantly, you know, talking to teachers who, uh, you know, they just don't know what to do with their kids, right? I've given workshops for a lot of them, and it's really set that they really feel very pressured. So they, you know, they get, the, you know, somebody who has very little experience, they get their kids to open up their their their, their mouth and sing some tunes and uh and then check off that they've fulfilled the music requirements it's really it's really a pretty sad state of affairs i really feel for for the teachers who already have so much on their plate um they really shouldn't have to be you know doing all of that yeah i couldn't agree more 
Um, how are you doing for time, Brian? Do you have a little more time with me here? Um, a little more time. So I'm being sensitive to the fact that somebody listening to this <laughs> might not. <laughs> well, uh, to be honest. Uh, oh, you're going to be editing anyhow. So. Well, the, 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 I actually don't edit a single thing with these things. These oh, are, I people see. People hear them There's as they no. come. And uh, I'm a fan of longer podcasts personally because I had uh, to commute back and forth all the time to work in school so i would you know i'd play um 30 minutes one way 30 minutes the other if longer so and i'm sure there's a few other people in that boat but okay. I, I did then, wanna... all, then all then all i want to say is for those who are still listening thank you <laughs> yes thank you for me too and um for those still listening you're in for a treat because what i one of brian's expertise in, in my opinion is your ability to improvise and um, so just to give everyone some perspective, when I was taking my class with Brian, often what would happen is um, we're playing something and maybe Brian would have an idea and he'd go, oh, it should sound something like this. And you'd, you'd grab someone's guitar, you'd grab the piano and ding -a -ling -a -ling -a -ling, right there, right on the spot, something came up and it, it came from improv. And I'm wondering, what have you done to essentially master the art of improvisation? Mm. Thank you. Uh Boy, it's it's a you know it's a big it's a big world. It's 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 it really is my world in in in, in the largest part. So it's something I could speak a lot to, and I'm just going to gather my thoughts here yeah, no and problem. think about what's you know what's really key. Play is really key, and what I did is what we all what I did in great part, and is what we all have done, hopefully, uh, is play as children. And I extended a part of that, a big part of that, into my relationship with music. I knew... So Sorry to interrupt. When you say play, you mean like um, a kid playing with toys? There's, there's, there's so many parallels to the world of play in general and the world of musical play because they all involve discovery... Um, finding new relationships, enjoying a new sound or a new color or a new word. It's, it's you know, in its genesis, improvisation has to do with the enjoyment of, of getting awakened to new experiences and new combinations of experiences one has had thus far. So I, I played a lot with music and movement when I was young, and I enjoyed it. And one of the reasons I left the conservatory early, I think it was my good instinct, uh, just because there wasn't enough play happening, I started, I started to just naturally you know, improvise on even some classical pieces. Um, but my teachers didn't quite get that. And, uh, you know, I think I would have stayed on with that kind of formal training, which I eventually came back to. But um, I think the play element was listening that was missing there. And I just kept on improvising in my bedroom. I think it's pretty uh, instinctual to play. Uh, but obviously, I had a certain you know, I, I gravitated towards it. Not everybody is going to um, is going to do that. Uh, and I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, though years later, I really discovered that I knew what I, I I was I was in fact doing some kind of form of practice and discovery that was really aiding my overall musicianship. So. The most important ingredient is is absolutely play and being supported with the play experience and to to have somebody to help organize that play into into something that you can then like make really concrete improvisations out of because improvising is not just complete random play but from an artistic level it's learning how to build coherent musical statements out of play right so, it's like you're speaking a, a language absolutely and it's all the same materials that are available to a composer are available to an improviser but you need that spirit of play i was very fortunate when i was 16 years old to 
um, to meet a man named Fred Stone, who really turned my life around. Fred was a phenomenal teacher and 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 musician who toured with Duke Ellington and played with Toronto Symphony. He was the perfect person for me, in a sense, to meet because he had uh, both a classical and a, and a jazz background. And his his forte was really free improvisation. That is the art of making things up spontaneously forming coherent um, sentences out of that and uh, I often go back to a time when Fred Stone came to my school I didn't know him or of him at all and we um, and he talked about improvisation about about it having the same kind of integrity as 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 written music you know he was really um, he was really speaking to something that I had been doing in my bedroom, bedroom that no other teacher had ever honored. And he invited people at that workshop that day at the school to play with him. I brought my guitar in advance knowing this, and uh, and I put up my hand. I was very nervous. Right. And uh, and, and and then uh, and I said, "What you know? What should we play?" And he said, "Just." just we're just going to play we're just going to improvise you know and um and we just went into this free improvisation didn't talk about any keys any chords you know listening to each other and uh you know i was extremely nervous this was like you know absolutely the most famous musician <laughs> i mean i was only 16 right, right yeah you know that i'd ever encountered and and uh you know and i just came out of that improvisation just like you know i remember like you know people applauding you know the teachers whatever and um and you know he looked at me and he said uh, he said that was great man you know and it's just like i like honestly i start crying now wow <laughs> you know just what I, what I think about it was so touching and i said um i said thank you but i i don't know what i'm doing and he just <laughs> no and he just said very softly he said yes you do yeah, and that's that's so key is this idea that people think improv is just randomness and not knowing what's going on. It's it's the total opposite. It, it's it's embracing randomness, no doubt about it. But it, it's like an organized randomness, if that makes any sense. There there is a vocab that you're drawing from that it makes sense in the bigger picture. Absolutely, and and just for somebody to um, you know to honor that this stuff that I've been so-called fooling around with, you know, right. um, was real. Like, like, like I was, you know, through, through all the time that I had spent in my bedroom manipulating these sounds that I was attracted to, you know, organizing, reorganizing, um, you know, that was a form of practice. This was a way of making honorable music. And here's this great musician telling me, I know what I'm doing. And and th and this is and this is something that a lot of people with improvisation end up feeling like they don't know what they're doing. They they they, they feel you know they feel they feel bad you know they feel bad. They feel like right. they haven't been educated properly. But it's like you know you learn to ride a bike and you're like you're kind of like feeling your way around and eventually you get solid and you get empowered and you know what you're doing. Exactly. Through the through the experience of it, <laughs> you know, yep. and, and it's like um, so. So, just getting back to your initial question, you know, there's there's a lot of play, and I was fortunate to have some wonderful guides um, along the way uh, that brought me into this whole world of spontaneous music making. And uh, Casey Sokol at York University was uh, another big one for me, and it's uh, it's really an honor for me now to uh, having been his student about. I don't know, 35 years ago, maybe more than 35 years ago, um, to be working, um, you know, as a teacher in his in wow. his improv course now. But he was uh, very much another person, and continues to be, you know, just a you know great teacher at York who's instilling that sense in, in people of of making freely improvised music is is. Uh, it's not to be taken lightly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, of course, the play element. I don't mean it like that, but just like right. this is, you know, this is this is serious art. This is, uh, and in terms of the last record I made, it was a solo guitar record. This was this was the high for me. The high for me was I recorded six tracks without without pre thinking at all, without without 
thinking about what I'm going to play. I was just in the studio and I laid down the music in my mind at that very moment. And my idea was to turn this into a coherent piece that somebody wouldn't necessarily know if I had notated it before or not. It would right. be at that quality of structure. That's what I really um, sought to do. And in my liner notes, I, I ask a rhetorical question, you know, to, to myself, I say, well, you know, if it's really parallel to, you know, the written music that, that you're that you're that you're making because i also very much write out music i do both and i do a lot of combination if it's, if it's really that parallel why improvise it and what i what i what i answered myself was because i needed to ask myself this also uh, i answered um because of the freshness of the experience right. because of that you know there's something about you know the first time i saw the northern lights i was in a sleeping bag in northern manitoba crashing at a drive-in while i was hitchhiking you know on my way to to southern california and man i'm never going to forget that experience that was like awesome okay wow, yeah that's like or i'm never going to forget the first time i heard you know a british shismonti use a d flat chord with a g in the bass you know it's like right. <laughs> you know there, there's there's like there's something about you you aim you know, you're not going to get it all that time, but you, 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 you want, you want to have this, this awesome experience of, of discovery and manipulating ingredients spontaneously. And, and what happens for an audience when that's, when they, when they see that all unfolding, you know, um, in front of them in real time, there's something that's just, for me, that's just unparalleled about that experience of, of improvising. So uh, that's what keeps me in the game doing it. And it really, I mean, talking about liking challenges, that's where, that's where I get fed really big. And, um, and, and in the course we do at York, we, we, we teach a lot of the tools of improvisation, which, right. which have a lot of parallel to the tools of composition. So I teach my students how to, you know, improvise like uh, – you know, imitation, like in the style of the Renaissance, or to improvise something in the style of a Bach fugue. We might look at a Bach fugue, look at the, the kinds of harmonic procedures that happen, and then, you know, and then go, then go and try to do it. Or we might just sometimes just improvise from a rhythmic gesture, or perhaps inspired by a story, or a color, or a particular AAB form. There's many places that we can that we can go into an improvisation way with we learn a lot of tools where you might just start fresh some might be more stream of consciousness where the first part of the improvisation doesn't relate at all to the second part and it's more like thorough composed music some might be i get my students to do exercises like we have a theme um okay create a theme and say the student goes okay right. there's your little motif little idea now continue to improvise I'll say for 30 seconds and bring that theme back. Right back to it. So the kinds of tools that we might be practicing, you know, in terms of looking at melodic shapes and harmonic structure and so forth, we start to actually, you know, practice on our instruments or with our singing voice. And, you know, and then another kind of improvisation, like more stream of consciousness, might not relate those ideas so there's so many different ways that we can go into it so that is developing you know the craft of music improvisation and and i felt like i needed to say that because there's a real misconception out there that you know some people are just quote unquote natural improvisers <laughs> you know some people learn the way of the notes some people like learn the way of the ear well you know uh. they, they can it's it's not like that it's like uh you know, we have to use our ears all along, and some people certainly don't engage in play, or their, their teachers taught them, uh, you know, otherwise it, it wasn't instilled, or perhaps they just never even played much, period. Like, exactly. you know, as a, as a child, you know, there's a whole spirit that, go, that, go, that goes with discovery that, that is definitely, you know, around play. So it's really dichotomized, and, and I think we need to break the boundaries there, too. It's not just like there's people who play from written scores, people who improvise, there's a lot lot of combinations a lot of combinations that need to happen and we and i 
definitely feel very strong that we need to 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 always be instilling and inviting um, in education a sense of play. Um, like I'm a real goofball and I'm really proud of it. <laughs> and I'd sure, I'd sure, you know what? I, you know, and musicians, musicians in general, like they're pretty funny. And I have to say cl- jazz musicians. <laughs> right, right. It, it, in particular, like a wicked sense of, of humor. And it's really, you know, now, I don't want to dichotomize here, but I have to say as a general observation, and I live in both these worlds, jazz musicians are a lot funnier than classical musicians. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Okay. And so there's there's something there like with with, uh, you know, with the whole the whole play element and and that, and that gets shut down far too early. You know, like we yeah. we play we play in kindergarten and, you know, before you know, it, we're out of the sandbox. Well, I am really. I'm really for the forever in the sandbox. movement. (laughs) That's beautiful, man. I think a lot of people can learn from that. And um, just if I can touch my own opinion on the improv thing, I think you really hit the um, the nail on the head when you said the the complete wrong mindset to go into improv is the with this idea that you're either born with it or you're not. I it, it frustrates me to no end when I when I ask a musician, can you improv something over this? And they go, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that. Be-. Or sorry, they say I don't know how to do that. I, I'm I'm not good at that. And I go, well, have you ever done it? No, I've never done it. <laughs> and it's you know, it's it's like you said. There's a skill to it. There's a practice, no doubt, that you need to develop. It's a craft. But if you're afraid of even trying it if you're just um if the reason you haven't even done it before is 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 literally a a lack of confidence you're missing an important part of the musical experience it's only half of the equation is understanding um how to read and how to you know uh, intellectualizing music and the other half of the experience in my opinion is to be able to feel the music and i find that improv helps me feel music the most Mm -hmm. yeah sure it's like being absolutely well you know beautifully put being engaged in the in the very ingredients that are in written works of music i mean this is again going back to like a parallel with language we are improvising i've done this with with uh, high school principals when i was trying to sell an improv program to 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 a few high schools right. and t- we were talking about improvisation and i i actually you know I, I i said to one principal i said you know do you think we're improvising right now and he said and he thought about it for a second and he said yeah <laughs> i said exactly we're using we're using stores of phrases we're, we're, we're manipulating, we're re-manipulating, we're coloring here and there. On occasion, you know, one of us might use a new word or say something in a rhythmic way that we've never done before. But that, you know, that's kind of creative breakthrough. But mostly, right. like, we're, we're, we're recycling, you know, reinterpreting, shading. And that's what improvisers do, right? You, exactly. You, you, look, you, you, you learn, that's what composers do. I mean, Bach, Beethoven, Handel, all they're all great improvisers. All composition starts from, from improvisation. So it's like it's learning to speak, manipulate the language that that we're using in our in in our on our on our musical journey. It's very very obvious when you and I are talking about yeah. this. Um, but because music education and education in general has been so didactic, it's it's gone in so many other directions beyond uh let's experience this um yeah yeah so but it's interesting that we we seem to understand that more with language rather than with 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 music we we understand that to gain vocabulary uh to have the skill set that you and i can carry on this conversation we have needed to be spoken to well first our ears opened up in the womb we have we have the world of sound around us Hopefully, our mothers, you know, were were engaged with us while while we were pregnant. There was there was sound around, music around, fueling our brains. Synapses begin to get fired off. We're, you know, we have little conversations, mutterings turn into words, turn into set to senses. We start reading, and everything is like feeding everything. And before you know it, we're talking more. We're improvising. Exactly. Hey, hey. so. You know, there's a nice parallel that could be found in music training that way, you know, and it happens like, you know, we're we're doing all that stuff. <laughs> Just don't like don't, you know, don't don't shut it off. You know, as as teachers, we have to be really sensitive to not shutting off the play, the play element. I agree. 
Yeah, and, and just, um, you know, understand it as a skill and not a, a born innate ability. This is something that can be learned and some will be quicker than others, but it can be done and it should be done in my opinion. Um, so, Brian, I think this is a good place to end it. This was awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on here with me. Pleasure, pleasure. And uh, thank you for having me, and I've enjoyed uh, speaking with you. And thank you to the listeners, and uh, I hope uh, that your ears have been opened up to a few ni- few new ideas, and that you will uh, that you will continue to improvise away on your journeys. That's great, man. And if the listeners want to find more information on you or your, some of your music, where can they look? Uh, BrianCats.com is a good first place, and there's some uh, YouTube videos up there and uh, yeah, a whole bunch of things. Great. Thank you again, Brian. Okay, thanks. Have a great day. have a good one. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Bye. That's it for today's episode. If you guys like what you heard, follow us on Twitter at underscore thecasepot.net. Search for The Knowledge Spot on Facebook or SoundCloud, or check us out at www.thecasepot.net. Lastly, if you guys have any questions for me, I plan on doing my own personal Q&A session for YouTube, so email me at contact at thecasepot.net.